Hello everyone, this is Bob and Threadbear, and welcome back to Threadbear Reviews. For today's review, I've got quite the novel request by patron JimJam78, a little book by Norman Spinrad titled The Iron Dream, which was published by Avon Books in 1972. Except it's also a novel called The Lord of the Swastika, written by Adolf Hitler in 1954. Let me explain. About the author. Norman Spinrad was born in 1940 in New York City. He got his high school education in Brooklyn, and he went to a local college in Manhattan to get his bachelor's degree, specifically in pre-law. However, he would not end up pursuing a law degree, and instead, five years after his graduation, he published his first science fiction novel, titled The Solarians. It was apparently a fairly traditional space opera story about war and aliens. But for his fourth novel, Spinrad went with a more gritty, cynical story called Bug Jack Barron. The title character of Bug Jack Barron is a talk show host and opinion maker, and he uncovers a conspiracy around an immortality treatment that cuts a few too many corners, let's say. And even though the book is set in America and came out in 1969, it apparently used too much explicit language and was too cynical about politicians and it was therefore criticized and partially banned in the United Kingdom. The Iron Dream was Spinrad's fifth novel, and it got published in 1972. It also faced a lot of controversy, because the conceit of the novel is that instead of becoming the German Chancellor, Hitler became disillusioned with politics and emigrated to the United States in 1919. Once there, he became a pulp science fiction illustrator, wrote a few successful novels in the genre, and then ended his career with Lord of the Swastika, which he wrote in 1954, shortly before he died from, most likely, late-stage syphilis. After the book ends, there's a short analysis that tears the novel and its author apart and offers a bit of alternate history information, and Spinrad has been very clear that the Iron Dream is a satire, specifically a satire of contemporary American speculative fiction. However, that didn't stop West Germany from banning the book for promoting Nazism, a ban that would later be lifted, nor did it stop the American Nazi party from putting the book on its recommended reading list. On the other hand, the novel also got nominated for a Nebula Award. So what exactly does this novel say, and how does it say it? Let's find out. The Review Ferric Jagger, which basically means Iron Hunter, lives in a post-nuclear hellscape where humans have mutated beyond recognition, except for the inhabitants of Helder, where the original human genotype is alive and well. However, Helder isn't doing too well after losing a big war against its neighbors a generation ago, and Farrakh's parents were exiled as part of the peace process. However, Farrakh is all grown up now, and he wants to return to Helder and help the nation regain its glory. What follows is a variation on Hitler's biography, one in which Hitler gets exactly what he wants when he wants it. Ferrick emigrates to Helder and convinces the residents of a beer hall to storm a border checkpoint and kill the Dominator who works there, with Dominators being vile mutants who look human but can control other people's minds and turn them into communists. For his success, he is made the leader of the local extreme right party, and he travels to Helder's capital to expand his influence. Along the way, he convinces a motorcycle gang to join his cause and rediscovers the Great Truncheon of Helder, which can only be held by a true son of the old monarchy. Farrakh then runs for office, starting riots against the Dominator-controlled Universalist Party, and once he succeeds, he performs a coup d'etat to become the supreme commander of Helder. As Supreme Commander, Ferrick first kills his old supporters in the motorcycle gang, because they were turned against him by Dominator spies. He then invades what's basically Poland to protect Helder against the Dominator menace in what's basically the USSR, and after the front stabilizes, he invades other countries to the south and west to gather strength. He then makes a final push against the Dominators, conquers the capital, but is denied a complete victory when the last living Dominator launches a nuclear weapon that spreads contaminated soil all across Helder. But that's no problem, because Helder scientists have mastered cloning technology, 
and don't have to worry about radiation or the randomness of breeding. In fact, they also master interstellar travel, and so the book ends with human clones led by a ferric clone flying off to conquer alien worlds. So the first thing I'll say is that this book reviews itself, and the analysis section at the end brings up a lot of the points I was planning on mentioning. There's constant allusions to masculinity and phallic imagery, there isn't a single female character in the story, not even as a token love interest, and the book is obsessed with depicting the heroes as clean and spotless, and the villains as filthy and disgusting. However, there are a few additional points I'd like to bring up, which the book fails to mention. First off is the constant use of purple prose. Purple prose refers to the overuse of descriptions and flowery language to the point that it gets distracting. In other words, it's the practice of saying with ten words what you could have said with two. Let me give you a random example. The wan morning sun was obscured behind a leaden sky as Ferrick sat on his motorcycle at the head of his SS division, watching his timepiece tick off the last few moments to zero hour. It's fancy prose for the sake of fancy prose, and not for the sake of describing the scene. I haven't read any other books by Spinrad, and so I can only wonder how much of this purple prose is satire, and how much of it is Spinrad. Also, the book always refers to their weapons as truncheons, and never as clubs. It might be that the preferred terminology changed over the past 50 years, but I don't think that's the case. Secondly, there's the rather obvious fact that Ferric Jagger is a power fantasy and a Mary Sue. He never makes the wrong decision, he is loved by all his allies and hated by all his enemies, he has the biggest and hardest truncheon in all of Helder, he wins all his battles, and the one time someone betrays him, he learns about it well in advance and takes care of it immediately and without remorse. Now the analysis at the end does touch on this topic, but the concept of the Mary Sue hadn't been formalized yet, and so it talks around the topic more than it talks about it. My point in bringing it up is that because Ferric can't lose, and because it's obvious Ferric can't lose, the story is very boring. And I think that's the biggest sin of this novel. It's written too earnestly. If you write a bad story as a joke, then you've told a good joke, but you've still written a bad story. And since Hitler writing a good novel isn't a good joke, I think Spinrad would have been better off writing a story about Hitler's writing process and his book's reception, rather than writing the book itself. It would have satirized the same topic, that being the fascist undertones of mid-century American science fiction, but it could have been a lot more humorous, entertaining, and obviously satire than the novel we got is. Another thing I'd like to mention is the bit of alternate history we get in the analysis. The critic who writes it goes off on a political tangent about how most of Europe has become part of the Greater Soviet Union, and most of Africa has fallen under its sphere of influence, with only the United States and still fascist Japan standing against them. Spinrad identifies as an anarcho-syndicalist, which is a far-left philosophy, and since in the early 70s the USSR was at the peak of their apparent success, I get the impression that we're supposed to think that Soviet dominance is a good thing. However, Hitler and his critic are both against communism, and so the direct impression the book gives you is that Hitler and the Nazis were the only things stopping Soviet Russia from conquering the world, and this conquest is bad. Between this conclusion and the earnestness of the primary novel, it's no wonder that real fascists take this book at face value. So, should you read this book for yourself? No. No, you shouldn't. It's good to know this book exists, and that fascist and racist beliefs are more common than you'd think in mid-century science fiction and fantasy, but it's not worth the time it takes to read. The Analysis Since The Iron Dream effectively analyzes itself, I'd like to use this section to instead offer a short guide on how to spot fascist themes in speculative fiction. But do keep in mind that having a couple of these traits does not mean that a work is fascist or fascist-leaning. There are other explanations. However, if a work has most or all of these traits, then it just might support a fascist worldview. Number one, 
If a work is so concerned with displays of masculinity that you wonder whether the male author is entirely heterosexual, then the work might be fascist. Number two, if an intelligent race is so evil and terrible that they would do themselves in the universe a favor by dying off, then the work might be fascist. Number three, if an intelligent race is universally better than every other race and deserves to have everything regardless of any actions they perform, then the work might be fascist. Number four, if there are enemies both without and within that require everyone to be vigilant and politically engaged, then the work might be fascist. Number five, if the heroes are objectively good and the villains are objectively bad, even though both sides are equally vicious and brutal, then the work might be fascist. Number six, if things were better in the old days and the present is only good because it returned to the old days, then the work might be fascist. Number seven, if a work is more concerned with conflict and pageantry than with anything else, then it might be fascist. That last point is really the biggest thing that this novel helped me realize. Fascism is a hollow ideology, and the only things it's concerned with are defeating the enemy and looking good while you're doing it. It doesn't care about domestic policies, about wealth distribution, about prosperity, about truth and facts, or even about who or what the enemy being defeated is. All a fascist wants to do is fight, and to make sure as many people as possible know they're fighting. Even winning is secondary, because if they win, they get to bask in victory, but if they lose, they can commiserate with their fellows. And if there's no clear winner, they can still claim they won. In The Lord of the Swastika, page after page is devoted to Farrakh's accommodations, how he presents himself to the public, how he organizes the parades and rallies of Helder. The only other activity that has as much focus is the fighting, the conflicts, and the battles. And even then, Farrakh always makes sure to have witnesses and rolling cameras that can record his mighty deeds for others to appreciate. On the other hand, the book spends only two or three pages total talking about the death camps they set up to exterminate all mutants. Once an enemy is defeated, they are below notice, and they are not worthy of consideration, freedom, or life. Thanks for joining me again for today's Threadbare Review, and I hope I'll see you next time. Until then, please remember to like, share, and subscribe, and if you have a little extra money to spare, you can support me on Patreon. Link in the description.